Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand and begin our service tonight. We're going to open up with prayer tonight. How many of you know that prayer works? Prayer changes things. Prayer makes things happen. So I'm so thankful for that. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I want you to remember my family, remember my mom, uh, remember Sister Sharon. Uh, anybody on my right-hand side got a, got a request? Brother Gilles? Okay, all right. Brother Tripp? Okay, Sister Heidi? be okay all right sister scarlet okay brother donnie okay miss bill's over there family middle section yes ma'am yes ma'am all right sister ashley sister christy all right sister carol All righty. Anybody else in the middle section? On my left, Sister Maria. Yes, ma'am. Miss Jane. Okay. All right. Sister Nadine. Okay. Brother Shannon. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Anybody else on the platform? Casey? Thanks, Sister Meredith. All right. Let's just take these knees to the, to the one that knows everything, all right? Lord, we love you tonight. God, we're so thankful. Lord, we ask you, God, to reach down, Lord, to meet these needs according to your will, God. We release faith in this place, God, knowing you're a healer. You're a deliverer, God. You're our Savior, Lord. God, we pray for those prodigals that's walked away from you, God. Those that need healing in their body tonight, God. Lord, reach down, Lord, and we pray that your will be done in each and every one of them, God. But Lord, we unite tonight in prayer, God, believing, God, that you are, God, and you are a reward of them that diligently seek you. God, we pray that your will be done, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Jesus' name, I pray tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift him up. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. And be ready to take up the offering here in just a minute. I was thinking today about how good God is. Sister Marie, he's, he's good. We say that God is good and he's good all the time. And it, it's so true. It, it's so true. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that. I've experienced it so much in my own life, Sister Crystal, how good God is. And uh, so, so thankful for that. I'll tell you what, before I take the offering up, I want to share a testimony with you tonight. I made a statement a couple weeks ago that if we're not praying for miracles, then maybe we've forgotten who we're praying to. And I got to experience that in a way that I really, really didn't want to. But uh, the weekend of Thanksgiving, uh, that Sunday morning, Brother Jill had preached about Lazarus. And his message, Brother Billy, was entitled by reason of him. It wasn't because of Lazarus. But it was because of what Jesus done through Lazarus that people left and made the change. You know, we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so I want to share a testimony with you tonight. We got home from that from church that Sunday, and uh, I text my son, and as I normally do, I text him and said, Hey, you know, what's what's going on? What's happening? You are you guys okay? And he said, Well, me and my me and DJ, which is my 15-year-old grandson, Sharon and I, 15-year-old grandson, he said, we're on the way to St. Louis, Brother Billy. DJ's got a soccer game after a while, and we're on our way to St. Louis. And I said, well, y'all be careful. I texted him and told him, y'all be careful. I love you. You know, I'm here if, I'm here if you need me. And uh, Sharon and I ate, ate lunch. She had roast potatoes and stuff cooked, and we ate, we ate lunch, Sister Eloise. And Brother, but, Brother Donnie, about 20, 30 minutes later, I looked down and John's calling me and I answered the phone and just as soon as I answered the phone I could tell something's wrong I could tell that he's crying and he said dad me and DJ have had a wreck and I need you to come to where I'm at he said we're on the other side of, of Perryville and at first when I when I heard what he said I, I, I thought he said him and DJ both had been ejected out of the vehicle and I found out later that DJ was the only one that was ejected out of the vehicle, my 15-year-old grandson. So uh, I rushed around, changed my clothes. Sister Sharon was wanting to go, and I said, he's needing us, needing me right now. So I left her there, and I know that was hard to do, and I took up, I took off up to where they were at, where this wreck had happened. And Brother Billy, at that time, I, I didn't understand what had all happened, but uh, my son had been teaching DJ how to drive. He's got a little, he had a little Nissan ex Xterra, and it's kind of top heavy and brother shannon they had stopped at perryville to get gas and when they got back in the vehicle john put his seat belt on and dj did not and john didn't catch that and i'm going to say that it is a miracle in itself if if you will and they got on up the ro road a little ways they were closer to saint mary's and there was a trooper that had a car parked on the side of the road and John told DJ, he said, son, you're going to have to get over. DJ's driving. He said, you're going to have to get over. And DJ, DJ was trying to get over, and there was a car behind him, and there was a car here. Traffic was just horrible that, that, that weekend especially. And so as he tried to get back over one last time, he jerked the wheel, and when he jerked the wheel, the car wrecked. The vehicle, the vehicle flipped, and uh, about the same time the wreck happened, one of their best friends, John's best friend and DJ's best friend, it was a dad and a son. They were on their way back from St. Louis on the opposite side of the interstate. And they seen John, they seen John standing out there. So they stopped about the same time this wreck had taken place. And Braden, which is DJ's best friend, had got out, run across the interstate and tried to run over there where they were at. Well, John told me, he said, Dad, when I came to, he said, I was still trapped within the vehicle. He said, I had my seatbelt on. And he said, I don't know how I got out. He said, but I knew that I had to find DJ. And he said, when I finally got, when I finally got out of the vehicle and got to where I could, he said, everything was like in slow motion. I think he took a blow to the head. He said, DJ was laying in the interstate. 
and DJ had blood coming out of his ear. He was having a seizure, and John said, Dad, I knew, I knew that I had to get to him because I had to get my fingers down his throat to keep him from swallowing his tongue. And he said, it was just like slow motion. I was trying to get to him, and he said, about the time I got to him, I looked up, and the trooper was coming. The trooper was walking. He had just let the person go that he had had stopped, and he was coming to where they were to assist him. And he said, Dad, I no sooner got the DJ and kind of laid myself over to him. The trooper was there. He was putting gloves on. And he said, all of a sudden, there were these three ladies there, Dad. And he said, they told me that they were nurses. And he said, they began to work on DJ. And he said... And, and Tony told this to me myself. He said, two of the ladies that were there, that were still there when kind of everything had, had, had got situated. And he said, but the third lady, Dad, he said, we don't know where she went. He said, we looked up and she was gone. And I said, well, that's an angel unaware that I pray for every day. Lord, put your hand upon my family. And so they called, they, they called the helicopter in and they had to... Harry Vac DJ to St. Louis Children's Hospital. He 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 was unconscious. John said he was moving some things. He was moving kind of his lower extremities. Brother Billy, you've been to the scene of the accident like that. Somehow or another, he had got ejected out of that vehicle. I don't know if it was out the side window. I know it wasn't out the windshield, but he was wind up in the middle of the interstate. And that is a miracle in itself, folks, to think that he winded up in the middle of that interstate and nobody ran over him. Nobody hit him. None of that took place. So just to kind of make a long story short, they took him to the hospital, flew him to the hospital. Tony took John on to the hospital. He didn't have to wait for me to get there. They run a series of tests on him, checked everything out. He did not have any broken bones. He did not have any major cuts to his face. He has some scratches, Brother GL, but no major cuts to his face. They could not find anything wrong with him, Brother Tripp. Could not find anything wrong with him. They let him come home that night. He was back at school Wednesday. How do you, can, if you got those pictures, this is his, this is a couple of pictures of the vehicle. I'm talking about the goodness of God. I'm talking about the protecting hand of God. I'm talking about a series of miracles that God performed along the way while this was happening, that he kept his hand on my grandson and not only my grandson my son it could have it could have been fatal for both of them if she can get those can you put those up there how do you they're not okay that's him this past saturday nothing wrong with him no scratches no scars no nothing and i want to thank the lord for that tonight i want you to rejoice with me i want you to rejoice with me about the goodness of god we talk about it all the time, but I've experienced it. Sister Ashley, I prayed for that miracle all the way to the hospital. And God performed a miracle, and I think, I'm thankful. I am so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. If you'll stand with me right now, we are going to take the offering. Don't forget about the different ways to give. There's Giveify. There is... The app on the paper, uh, online giving, you go to riverbendpentecostal.com. You can mail it in to 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri. And we give it any way you can. And I want us to say this prayer, and I believe this prayer works. God has blessed me so many, so many different times this year, Brother Richard. It's just blessings of God. Repeat after me. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing, there's not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, Sales and commission, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and return, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance. 
walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister Manny, give me one minute. I, I, I forgot part of this story, folks, that, that, it, that, that is, it, it is awesome. The next day, Tony, which was John's friend, had taken one of the ladies' names down, one of the nurses' names down. And he texted her, and he told her that he said and nothing was said about God. He said, miraculously, DJ got to come home from the hospital, said everything was all right. And John had told me that this lady, she was a nurse. She got down in the interstate, and she laid by DJ. And she sent this text back, and she told Tony, she said, I thank God for that. She said, I, got, I laid down, and I prayed for him. And he was a trooper. And she said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and she said, the Holy Spirit told me to look in my rearview mirror, and she said, when I looked in my rearview mirror, she said, I know that car flipped at least four times. That, that, that's how God works. Nothing was said about it. This lady said, the Holy Spirit told me to look in my rearview mirror, and she was able to hear him. And then go help my grandson. And I, I thank the Lord for that. Bring your offering to the front. Thank you. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Praise God. Praise God. Riverbend kids, you gather up the front. Praise God. Love to see the excitement on all their faces. Get ready to go. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Praise God. Praise God. All right, Sister Vi, lead them back here. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. All right. River Ben Ignati, you're dismissed to go to your class. All right, Brother Jill, looking forward to Bible study now, brother. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you serve a miracle working God? He's not the God that used to do miracles, but he still does. Amen. Brother Shannon has some handouts uh, for those of you that weren't here last week. Uh, if, you, if you weren't here last week, raise your hand. And he'll bring one to you. Those of you that were here, you should have brought yours back with you. Come on, somebody. Amen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, we're going to get into the word of the Lord and uh, uh, appreciate Brother David sharing that testimony with us and ask you to continue to hold up all of our children and grandchildren that are out there. And uh, we've got to get them back in the ark of safety with regard to salvation. Amen. And uh, so keep praying for them. Uh, I felt very strongly the last couple of days that we may be on the brink of a revival of those who've walked away. Very strongly been feeling it in my spirit. So uh, any, if you still need a handout, keep your hand up. Uh, and uh, if, we, if we run out, We'll have to get some more runoff, uh, but it is the same exact handout from last week. And uh, uh, while he's finishing those, how many have had the teaching of the bait of Satan slash elements as far as about how we deal with our emotions and and because it all is woven together? How many of you have had to had to put your money where your mouth is over the last? over the last couple of three weeks. I'll tell you, I think, i just tell you like this, I think the Lord made opportunities for me to have to do it. I do. I feel like the Lord has made it happen because we got to, we got to put this into action. And we've learned in recovery class and in elements class, and we're learning in here, the way to get it right is practice. Somewhere along the line this, in this relationship with God, people have a mentality that if you try and fail, just give up. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's called practice. That's right. Amen? Yes. And we're all on board with that. Right. We're going to help people get better, aren't we? Right. We're certainly not going to be a part of the damnation that spews out of the mouth of hell. Right. That's right. We don't damn people. We don't condemn people. That doesn't come from the Lord. So let's review just a little bit. I want to try to stay on focus tonight because we're going to cover chapter 3 and chapter 4. They, they go together, and I want to try to stay on focus. But I'll tell you, I've got a couple of messages that I want to hopefully will get received tonight. Luke 17, then said he unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. We got that settled. You are going to run into things that have the potential to offend you all the time. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone, that's a big old heavy brick, would hang about his neck and he cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, which simply means, hey, let him know that he did something. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, and turn again to thee, saying, I repent, 
thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith, which means that's a tough ask. What you want us to do, we're going to have to have more faith to do it. The message is not relegated only to if somebody uh, uh, trespasses against you, rebuke him, forgive him, da-da-da-da-da. But the message is learn to handle the offense rather than let the offense handle you. Okay, that's the message, is you have been given a pathway to be able to handle offense in the appropriate manner. Offense is inevitable. Being offended is not. When we get offended, it often results in us then becoming an offender. And that is unacceptable according to Scripture. The enemy of our soul baits the trap. The trap is, the bait is the offense, leading us to think and act with an offended heart, and it feels right to us, at least in that moment, because we're thinking with a carnal mind, and a carnal mind says, if you do something to me, i got to do something back to you. The wounds, and this is an area that I really want to deal with, the church folks we don't deal well with getting our cage rattled. We really like for the preacher, the pastor, the teacher to stay on people that don't come to church. We like us to talk about things we ain't doing. So we can say, preach it, brother. Preach it, brother. I know 53 people got that problem. But when it starts messing with us, Sister Leanne, it makes us uncomfortable. And I say, go get them. That's what we're looking for. All right? The wounds and hurts of being offended have long hindered many from finding their true destiny and their true calling in Jesus Christ. Now, all offended people can be placed into two categories. Those who have actually suffered offense and those who believe they have. Going through the fire of offense is an avenue that the Lord uses to perfect us. We're going to deal with that tonight. One of the signs of the end time is that many shall be offended. And on the wings of offense, they will betray one another and betrayal opens the door of hatred. I heard today and watched a little bit of John Bevere talking about this, and he added a little tidbit I'm going to give you that's not renewed, but he said if you even feel anything for somebody, you're probably not into hatred. Hatred is when you just absolutely don't care. Period. Period. They fall off the face of the earth and you don't care anymore. That's hatred. That's a scary place to be. But when we get offended, betray one another and hate one another, the very next scripture tells us that it opens the door for false prophets to rise up because our perception becomes skewed when we view through the lens of being offended and how many people have you heard over the years got to quit going to church or switch churches or go find something different because somebody offended them? And then you'll go, well, I don't believe. You begin to question everything when you look through the lens of offense. But when we understand the love of God, it frees us from the bondage of being gratified by those we love because we're satisfied with planting and watering seeds. And the bondage we've been under is that love is somehow supposed to have a reciprocity agreement with it. And what I mean by that is if you love somebody, they're supposed to love you back the same way, not with the love of God. The love of God is not contingent upon them reciprocating that love. 
All right? And I told you when it comes Christmas time, if God tells you to buy something for somebody, buy it for them. And if you're the one that gets something bought for you, don't go in there in the closet and change the name on a present and bring it out like you bought something for them. Because you feel ashamed. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We've got to learn to let somebody bless you without feeling like we're in some kind of cotton-picking competition. And that is just simply a microcosm of this true thing is just learn to love people. And don't get a mentality that says, well, I love you, so you're supposed to do this for me. It's not the way it works in the love of God. It's not the way it works. When we are offended, we build walls to keep the offenders out which ultimately leads to keeping everybody out, including God, and we have become prisoner of our own low expectations. The offense is the bait of Satan. It is what the trap is baited with. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy, and the avenue by which he does that is the opportunity to be offended. We will learn to handle, not only handle offense in a godly manner, but to view offense through the knowledge that God is in control and God is on the throne and that there is nothing, I'm going to touch this again in a minute, but there is nothing that the enemy can do or any other human being can do or any spirit can do to derail the will of God for your life. Now, let's move to the bait of Satan, part three, which is going to be, thank you, brother, chapters three and four. Well, I did good on that review. Last time it took about 35 or 40 minutes. We're going to focus tonight on those who have been genuinely mistreated. I felt it in elements. I feel it again now. I feel very focused, very confident that there are people in this room and there are people watching us online who God wants to heal you through this lesson. But there's some folks in particular tonight that God wants to minister to you. Those who have been genuinely mistreated those who really have had the opportunity to be offended. The title of this chapter was, How Could This Happen to Me? And I put in parentheses, I have a right to be offended. The dream becomes a nightmare, Genesis 37 through 48. We learn of the story of a man named Joseph. He was the second youngest of his brothers, the firstborn of his father's favorite wife. It's a story you have to learn for yourself. Don't have time to get into tonight, but he was the favorite son of his father, Jacob. And his father didn't make any pretense that Joseph was not his favorite. And he put the, the cherry on top of that, so to speak, was a coat of many colors, a multicolored coat that he had made for him, which uh, without, without delving into it a lot, Brother David, it was of great value. Anything was, that was a color was great value, but to be multicolored denotes a great lot of work and effort and energy. It was very high value. He was the favored son. And the hand of the Lord was on the favored son, even though he was a little bit of a dum-dum. And uh, so he has a couple of dreams. And one of his dreams is that he and his brothers were all sheaves of grain, which is you gather up a bunch of wheat, you tie it up with a, a piece of, of a, a twine, and they would stand up and they kind of uh, got you know, uh, sprouts up at the top. And, and he said, in my dream, your sheaves bowed down to my sheave. And then he had another dream when they were him, brothers and his father and mother were the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they all bowed down to it. And the thing about young whippersnapper Joseph is he could not wait to go tell them what he dreamed about them. 
I want you to think about this just for a minute. Young and immature, hand of God is upon him, but he ain't perfect yet. What do you think? He knows they don't like him. All right? He has these dreams. Why do you think he told them? He's let, putting them in their place. He has an idea. I want you to lock on to this. He has an idea of what that dream means. One day, I'm going to be the boss. Okay? Now, his brothers, after he told them the dream, they hate him even more. And they make a plan to kill him. Well, in the meantime, they changed their mind. And they said, we just well make something off this rascal. So they decide to sell him into slavery. And while they held him till the slave traders came, they put him down in a hole in the ground, a pit in the ground. Now to be sold into slavery in biblical times was a big deal. What didn't just affect Joseph, it affected his entire bloodline. His wife, his children, his grandchildren, everyone in Joseph's lineage from this time forward would be a slave. It was in effect obliterating Joseph's identity as a son of Jacob while allowing him to live. One person said it's probably a fate worse than death as Joseph went from most favored son to slave and it would become his legacy. But he sold to Potiphar, who is one of Pharaoh's chief army men, for, for lack of a better word. He sold to a man named Potiphar, and God blesses him in Potiphar's house, so he sold as a slave, but it's not very long. I feel the Holy Ghost right now, so I want you to please hear me because I'm about to minister to somebody and I've never thought of this before. It may turn into a little bit of Sunday preaching in here in a minute, but I want you to let the word minister to you. He was sold to Potiphar. So he went to, he went to work as a house slave for this man named Potiphar. But the hand of God was upon him in Potiphar's house. And it's not very long, Brother David, till he is the main man in Potiphar's house, second only to Potiphar, and Potiphar trust him with everything in his house. But here's the deal. Joseph is so blessed, Potiphar's wife gets a hankering to get with him. She wants to sleep with Joseph. And Joseph refuses. He won't have anything to do with her. He won't flirt with her. He won't talk with her. He won't hang around with her. She continually pursues him and becoming offended at his refusal one day when the house was empty, she grabbed a hold of him and when he ran off, he shook his coat off. She held on to it and when Potiphar came home, she said, look at here, this Hebrew you brought in amongst us tried to force himself on me today and I grabbed a hold of his robe to prove it. And Joseph is thrown into prison Now the prison experience, don't be jaded or skewed, your vision skewed of the prison. It was nothing like what prison might be now, even in its worstest form. All right, it was a pit. Here we are again. A hole in the ground. No light. Wet. Crowded. And it appears that when you were imprisoned, you had two fates. Be executed or die there. It's important to notice it was a horrible experience. So now we come to the question, is God in control? At what point in Joseph's journey did his mind grasp the truth that he was in God's perfect will? At what point in this story 
Does Joseph grasp the truth that he's in God's perfect will? He went from favorite son. Now we would all like to say that if, if, we, if our family had a passel of youngins and we was the favorite one, we would like to think that we wouldn't act bad, but you would. You would. He was the most favorite son. Now he's hated and a slave to the lowest status available. And then it looked like he's getting a break in Potiphar's house. Conviction and principle cause him to be falsely accused and imprisoned. He obeyed the law of God and the will of God. And he got thrown in prison for it, Brother David. He hadn't really violated any law of God. He hadn't done anything wrong toward God. Exactly whose fault is this? We know from experience that his mind could have run the gamut of answers. First thing he could have said is, while he's in prison, he could have said, you know what? This is my dad's fault. If dad hadn't have treated me better than everybody else, I wouldn't have never got in this place in the first place. Good old dad could have just played favorites in his mind. Why did he have to make such a big deal about it? I didn't ask for that pretty multicolored coat. I didn't ask for that. Dad could have just kept his opinions to himself. And then there were these dreams, and I think they were from God, but when I shared them, it caused me worse trouble. Then my brothers... They wouldn't behave, and when I told on them, their hatred deepened. Then they sold me into slavery, and I started doing good in the, in the Potiphar's house. Then his conniving wife, Potiphar believed that Huzzy's tales over me, and now I'm in jail, and I just don't see any way God can work. And those faded dreams are just that, dreams, and now they're broken. And I wish I never would have had them. Finding somebody to blame in your calamity, in your dilemma, in the quagmire of your offense, finding somebody to blame isn't difficult. It's a long list of people I could blame. Especially when I can justify every one of my feelings. It's not really a mystery whose actions led me to this place. But I say this again, no one or anything has the power to displace the will of God or the plan of God for your life. Nobody or nothing. The treatment of Joseph, hear me now. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a slip up. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a stumble. It was a eyes wide open intentional slamming of him. It was wide open. Potiphar's wife knew what she was doing. His brothers knew what they were doing. The slave traders knew what they were doing. There wasn't any mistakes here. Joseph was done wrong. So at what point during the offense do we begin to acknowledge the sovereignty of God? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the offense, is everybody with me tonight? I feel like I'm having trouble connecting. The offense had to do its job without Joseph becoming offended. Yeah. We'll say that again. The offense had to work. There was a purpose for it. And it had to work without Joseph getting offended. Because if he gets offended, Brother Terrence, it waylays everything in God's plan. Come on now, y'all got to get with me. So are you kind of like saying like if he were to get offended, then he would retaliate like in, in like a carnal mind? Absolutely. And, he'd be, and, and God's plan would be derailed. Okay, God's got a plan, Brother David. Oh, my goodness. 
We're looking at Jesus Christ. We're looking at the Savior of the whole world. Eternity depends on Joseph going through all of this. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I hope that there's some hmm, hmm going on in our minds right now and say, reckon that stuff I went through, God might have had a purpose in it. And you know what, Brother Blake? I didn't handle it so good. Maybe some of that stuff I went through, God had a purpose in it. And I'm on. Mm. Brother David, he could not get offended. But he had to go through all of that or he couldn't be who God wanted him to be. So look at here. I'm about to minister to you. I'm going to minister to you. I've never seen this before in my life. Let's talk just a minute. Could it get any worse? Could it get any worse? He's in prison. Well, guess what happens in prison? Somebody hear me right now. Somebody lock into this. If you're sleepy, stand up. Slap yourself in the face. Don't drink coffee. Don't, don't, but don't, don't zone out on me. He's in prison. Not, not yet. God blesses him. And the next thing you know, he's chief trustee in prison. Now, Brother Larry, that don't make no sense because he's a foreigner. But Come on, folks, you got to stay with me right now. I'm about to minister. I wish this was Sunday, but God knew it wasn't. I want you to hear me right now. And some of you folks that you've been here in the church since just after Noah and the ark, I want you to hear me right now because I'm about to minister to you. Brother David, he started being blessed in prison. I said he started being blessed in prison. And he got elevated right underneath the top man. And he connected with a couple of prisoners. One of them was a butler and one of them was a baker. And one night, oh, I wish the Holy Ghost could move in here. Let it. One night... Or two nights, the Bible doesn't really say, but these boys had them a dream. The butler had a dream and the baker had a dream. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the dreams because that's not important. But what's going to happen is the baker is going to be executed. His dream talked about his head being lifted and he was going to be hung by Pharaoh. The butler was going to be restored. Oh, Holy Ghost, help me right now. Uh, uh, uh. When the butler is packing up his stuff to leave, theoretically, Joseph says, oh, don't forget me when you get there. Now, Brother Larry, I want you to think about this just for a minute. Joseph was doing in prison the very thing God was going to use him through when he got in the palace. The same power was working in him in the prison that was going to be working with him in the palace. He got forgot in prison for two years. Now hear me now. Brother Terrence, 
He's been thrown in jail and now God's blessed him. There is a place, I want you to hear me right now. There is a place where Joseph can decide, I must be in the perfect will of God. Maybe it's my duty. Maybe it's my responsibility. I've been mistreated everywhere I've ever been. Nowhere lower that I can go. Maybe I'll just, somebody hear the Holy Ghost right now. Maybe I'll just stay here in jail. God's blessing me. God's leading me. God's guiding me. I've been forgot. I've been mistreated. Sister Maria, he can get offended and be blessed and stay there. God is still working on him. God is still working through him, but he has fallen short of his destiny. Yeah, I don't think I did that good. Same spirit's working in him, interpreting dreams. That's what's going to happen in a few minutes when Pharaoh gets him out of jail. Okay? It's what's going to elevate him to his destiny. Same thing. He's all... He's already doing it. I hope, man, are, are you seeing what I'm saying? There's some folks I'm ministering to right now that you stayed in prison because you grasped a hold of the offense and you said, here I'm blessed. And here, you know, I guess this is, God help me. This is just going to have to be good enough, I guess. Oh, I hope somebody's hearing me right now. God is working on me. God is blessing me. God is touching me. I guess I'm just going to have to, I guess this is just what I'm supposed to be. I guess, so I'm just going, Butler forgot me. Potiphar's wife lied on me. All that's ever happened in my life is people turned on me. But God blessed me here, so this must be where I belong. Are y'all seeing this picture? Sister Maria, there are people under the sound of my voice right now that connect with what I'm saying. You were never meant to fulfill your destiny in prison. You were never meant to fulfill what God had for you in prison, but you could not hold out. Oh, my goodness. So I don't care how old you are. I don't care what you've been through. I'm telling you, there's a light bulb going off in your spirit right now that says, you know what? I knew, whoa, I knew I was made for more than this. I knew God had for more than this for me. I just became settled in my offense. I just became settled in being offended and blessed. I just thought it was all right to stay where I'm at. Oh, I felt it so strong in my spirit, Brother David. I feel so, so did I, did, is that clear? Is that clear? That we've stayed in bondage. God used him just, he didn't use him any different. No different. But jo, jo, Joseph didn't get to fulfill. He would not have fulfilled what God sent him there for if he would have got offended. Oh, Holy Ghost minister right now, Lord. Is everybody with me? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I want it so bad to get in. To get in. I, I hope to goodness, I'm not being ugly, but I hope there's some people here that you go home and you just expect to go through your routine and you lay down in your bed and you lay awake all night long with that thought reverberating in your spirit. I was blessed in prison, I was used in prison, and I got used to it, and I accepted it, and I just decided to embrace the offense. But the Holy Ghost sent the preacher by today to tell me he ain't done with me, that the destiny remains the same. 
that the calling remains the same. And yes, you've been blessed locked up. You've been blessed in prison, but there's a palace waiting on you. There's a destiny waiting on you. There's a fulfillment waiting on you. No, 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 no. Listen to me. Your family is waiting on you. Brother Larry, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. It was the life in the completion of his family that was the reason for being in the palace. It wasn't so Egypt would be blessed. It wasn't so people would think good about him. It was so when his family showed up, he would have what they needed to live. My God. Oh, my Lord. Brother Cody, I don't know when I felt the anointing as heavy as I feel it right now. It ain't all about you. That's why I don't have it in my notes, but Genesis chapter number 50. Genesis chapter number 50. In verse number 19 and 20, Joseph told his family, he said, but as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it. God meant it. You know what it is? The whole journey. <laughs> oh, God. The whole journey. Oh, I got out of my truck tonight, Brother Blake, and the Holy Ghost gave me a word, a quickening word that's going to eliminate a whole lot of my distractions. It said, rejoice and be exceeding glad. When for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Blessed are they which are persecuted for my sake. Blessed are you when men shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You know something, Sister Leanne? What I feel right now, it didn't come cheap. No. Oh, my goodness. What do you think, Brother David? I mean, or, oh, I've never seen that before. I've never seen it before. They got the same anointing, the same blessing, the same operation was in him in prison. He could have embraced it and stayed there. Oh, Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong, Brother Blake. God is ministering in this house right now. He's ministering in this place right now. Brother David, do you understand our whole eternity hinges on the fact that we've got to learn to handle offense the right way? It's coming. We can't get away from it. It's coming. And we have lived with it for years and we've handled it poorly. Oh, my Lord. Yes, sir. He was 100% a type of Christ. The pit, now everything included. Yes, sir. Yep. 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 And both, uh, with the of Jesus and Jesus yep. Yep. It's an incredible study. It's an incredible study. But Brother Billy, somewhere along the line, Joseph had to get in his mind, the hand of God is on me. I knew it was going to be and it ain't felt like it for a long time. But he had to stick with it. But what that does, Brother Billy, is it lets us see. We get blinded by the fact that we know Jesus was God. But this gives us a glimpse into what Jesus Christ actually had to go through as a man. 
And that's why the Bible says, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Nobody is ever going to say, you know what, God has been so good to me, I'm going to quit going to church. Yes. But everybody who quits going to church, everybody who falls out with God or the pastor or their neighbor or their Sunday school teacher or the song leader or whoever, everybody knows whose fault it is. Nobody ever says, God was just too good to me. I enjoyed living for God too much. I just had to quit. Anybody walks away, you got a face for it. You got somebody to blame. How many people would have never walked away if we would have ever got in our mind that the offense is not my destiny? Prison is not my destiny. My destiny is life. Not just for me, but for my whole nation. And I want to move on right now, but I'm telling you, we got to. We got to get it. We got to get it. I want to. I, I pray for a holy forgetfulness to come on me, brother David. Not just so I can handle offense. I want to forget every one of them. Smooth, forget them. Smooth, forget them. I really want to get to the place where I'd be like Jesus Christ, Brother Billy, and say, Lord, just forgive them all. And mean it from my heart. Not from my lips, but from my heart. Because Joseph, I'm about to get done. Just with this part. <laughs> when Joseph went and told them his dream, the picture he had in his mind was of him sitting high and them down low. But the opposite is just the truth. Brother David, if he hadn't went through what he went through, he would not have been in a position when his brothers came. Oh, Holy Ghost, help me right now. When his brothers came and stood before him and knelt, they knelt and the dream came true. And let me tell you what Joseph did. Joseph had to run off in the other room, Sister Sheila, because he was, he was overwhelmed with compassion and love. Can't nobody do you like that but Jesus Christ. Can't nobody make you like that but Jesus Christ. There ain't a soul in this whole world that would have blamed him if he'd have grabbed every one of them and said, now what do you think, sucker? Come on, what do you bow down now? Bow down. No, he didn't. He couldn't wait to stand them up and fill their, their sacks up with groceries. He couldn't wait to give their money back to them and let them have it for nothing. And every, bit of, every bit of meandering that he did was to try to get connected back with his family because he said... Genesis 45 and 7. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And I'll this next, about next four words. And he hath made me. Forget about what he made him. He hath made me. He hath made me. God has a plan. And his plan for you might include offense. And if that's the case, we can't afford to get offended. So we better get this down. Because 
What if the pressure from the potter's hands looks and feels like a fence? So let's move over here. Oh, goodness. Yep, I can get through it. Here. My father, my father. Love hate relationship. Saul. I don't know. Ah, hush. Saul. That guy won't listen to me when I want to talk to her. <laughs> Saul fell out of favor with God. He was impatient, rebellious, stubborn, and disobedient. He pushed God to the point that God said, I'm done with you as king. And he went, sent Samuel to Jesse's house and he anointed a young lad named David as king. David is anointed, blessed, and used of God. David begins to play the harp for Saul, soothing his feelings. Being away from the presence of God has caused Saul to get in a bad place. And this harp player named David, he plays for him. And uh, Saul feels better. He's blessed. David is anointed, and it's starting to show privately and publicly. David becomes a mighty warrior. He's married to the king's daughter, eating at the king's table. One day, Saul hears the young lady singing a song they wrote. Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. Rather than a compliment and give an honor to a soldier that he raised up, Saul gets angry. And on at least two occasions while David was playing his harp, he threw the javelin at him and tried to kill him. And eventually he became so jealous of David that David had to flee the palace. David is lost because it seemed like he was anointed. God made a place for him in the palace, but now all of a sudden he's on the run and living in the wilderness in caves and pits. He's no longer welcome. He thought he was right on the precipice. He thought Saul is going to help me. He's going to teach me. He's going to train me for the throne, oversee my growth in fulfilling the will of God. But now he wants to kill me. It's to the wilderness David flees. There he lives in caves and sloughs and other hiding places, always looking over his shoulder, always on the run from Saul. One particular night, David and his men are hid in the back of the cave that Saul comes in, quite frankly, to use as a, as a place to relieve himself, use the bathroom. And he shuts his robe to go to the bathroom, and while his robe is laying there, David reaches out and cuts off a piece of the robe. And Saul puts his clothes back on and walks out, and as he gets out, David runs out of the cave, and he says to him, My father! It's a hopeful cry. He wants to prove how loyal he is to Saul. He wants to get things fixed so the plan of God can be restored and he can go back home and they'll continue as they are and David will continue to grow and appears like it works. Saul realizes what a jerk he's been and he apparently loads his guys up and goes back to give up the hunt. David isn't invited back to the palace, though. And after a short respite, Saul decides, again, I'm thinking I'm going to kill David. He gets 3,000 men, begins to chase him. David is doubly wounded because, Brother Terrence, he said, I let Saul know what he meant to me. I showed Saul how loyal I was to him. I had a chance to kill Saul in an undignified place. I could have killed him while he was using the bathroom. But instead, I chose to use it as a moment to show him how much I was with him, how much I stood with him. But yet now he has gone back and renewed his efforts to kill me, and I'm still on the run. It wounded David to his core. He said, Saul knows my heart, and he wants to kill me anyway. Second time, God makes it possible for David to come near Saul. He calls Saul's guards, his soldiers, and Saul himself to fall into a deep sleep. David and his loyal soldier Abishai make their way into the camp, and all of Saul's army are laying around everywhere asleep. 
the guards fell asleep. There's a deep sleep come upon them. And I want you to hear now what Abishai says to David. Are you ready for this? He turns to David and says, look at here. God has delivered them into your hand. Hey, you know what? Looks like he has. Looks like he has. Abishai said, say the word. I'll drive him to the ground with this spear right now. God has delivered your enemy into your hand. See, Saul, here a while back, David went to the tabernacle and he got Goli the, the sword of Goliath and he ate the shoe bread and a guy named Doeg, a, 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 a traitor, a, a servant of Saul, went and told Saul and Saul comes back and kills 85 members of the priesthood because they helped David. No wonder Abishai wants to kill him. Oh, Lord, help me right now. He now, for the second time after David has spared his life, he begins to chase him down, try to kill him again. Abishai is on the run with David, Brother Blake. They are reaping the benefits of Saul hating David. Here's the answer right at their fingertips, and God made a way for it to happen. I've got a point I want to bring out here, and then we're going to quit. Here's the deal. God is not working in the life of Abishai. God is not working in the life of Saul. God is working in the life of David. And David said to Abishai, 1 Samuel 26 and 9, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointing. I want to ask you a question. How does David know what God wants? He's been on the run. He's in the fight for his life. He's doing everything right. Brother Shannon, he's done nothing wrong. You know why he's on the run? Because he was right with God and Saul wasn't. He's living like a vagabond, Brother David. He's hated. Everybody in the kingdom wants him. Come on, David has been out with the Philistines having to pretend like he's crazy to keep from getting killed, slobbering all over himself and stuff, acting crazy. David has had to be humbled. To This is... That David has slain his ten thousands, that was true. He was a mighty man. He's a giant killer. Now he's hiding in caves. And God has made a way two times for David to destroy Saul. And both times, David has said, not a chance. He may die in battle. He may die at the hand of God. He may die an old man. But I know one way he won't die is at my hand how does David know that? How does David know that? He's been on the run. He's been fighting for his life. He's been living every moment fearful of being caught and killed. How does he know the will of God? Rather than spending time strategizing to kill Saul, David has been spending his time seeking after God. He's been spending his time in the Word. He's been, ooh, Holy Ghost. He's come to church every Sunday. He kept on coming to church every Wednesday night. He kept on coming to prayer meeting. I feel Jesus moving in here right now. He stayed faithful in everything. He kept on pushing through. He kept on giving when he didn't have nothing to give. And when the Lord presented him with the chance to be offended, he was so established in who he was that he said, not today, not by me. He stayed in the will of God, though by all appearances, he was completely out of the will of man. And to everybody else, it looked like God made him a way to be justified. 
But Sister Maria, he didn't anoint him to be justified. He anointed him to be king. And there was no shortcut to the throne. While wading through the quagmire of the offense and the offender, God revealed his will to David regarding his own behavior. Can't control Saul, but you can control you. And you're never going to get to a place where Saul can make you violate the law of God. But that relationship happened in the wilderness. This teaching is the pathway from prison. This teaching is the pathway from the wilderness, from caves. This teaching is the pathway to your destiny. Stand with me. Brother David, I, Brother Blake, sorry. That's a compliment, by the way, to be mistaken for Brother David. I want to be saved. And the old song says, above all else, I must be saved. What's happening, Sister Leanne? Seems very simple, but it's powerful. My desire for salvation has surpassed my desire to be justified. My desire to be pleasing to God it's surpassing my desire to be pleasing to people. And I'm not happy, blessed in Pharaoh's prison. Even though it feels the same, even though it has the same results, that's not my destiny. That's not my place. And while I'm running in the wilderness, oh, I got some stories I could tell you. I got some stories I could tell you of people being maligned and people being misunderstood and being on the run from those they once loved and they once held high esteem. It's going to happen, Brother David. Offenses are coming. But I got to learn how to respond to them. And if they're the Lord, I have to be willing to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away Blessed be the name of the Lord. Dear God in heaven, we love you tonight. Man, the anointing is rich in this place. The burden is heavy. The word is powerful, pertinent, applicable. It's right here. I pray this seed falls on good ground, God. I pray that it falls on good ground. And if it's already been planted, I pray that it's being watered and the increase will come. I pray that the revival, the individual revival that I see in my spirit begins to flourish even right now. Perhaps the embers from a fire once thought dead are beginning to smolder a little bit and beginning to smoke a little bit and, and there will be a raging fire once again where it was before. The blackened bricks of a burnout fireplace will once again put forth the warmth and the light and the comfort that they were designed to do in the spirit and the souls of every person in this room. I declare it. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What we got? Announcements? Sunday, December 19th, here at the church at 6. I'd like everybody to 